Okay, so welcome everyone um, to the latest uh, talk in the Geography Seminar Series. And very happy today to invite Pablo Fernandez Velasco, who is an IRC uh, postdoctoral research fellow in Trinity, but in the philosophy department. Uh, and Pablo is also got an affiliation to the Spatial Cognition Lab in uni uh, University College London, which is a, a base in neuroscience, but has a kind of interdisciplinary um, uh, approach to trying to un understand uh, spatial cognition. Um, and I think that's very reflected in Pablo's own work, which is a very inter interdisciplinary based in philosophy, um, but working with anthropologists, neuroscientists, psychologists, and uh, geographers as well. So the title of Pablo's talk is The Metaphysics and the Power of Place. And I'm really excited to hear some good hardcore philosophy today. Um, so wel welcome, Pablo. I'll turn uh, it over to you. And uh, yeah, we, get, we in about 35, 40 minutes or so, then we can have a discussion. So um, thanks, everybody. Pablo, I'll let you take it away. Great. Thanks so much, Rory. So um, yes, as Rory said, I, I work um, mostly in philosophy of mind and also sometimes in the cognitive sciences more broadly. Um, but I work on questions of place and space and experience of place. And as I have been working on, on these questions during my PhD, I saw some um, interesting ontological or metaphysical questions about place, uh, which is where I moved uh, for my for, for this uh, postdoctoral project. And of course, a lot of that is basically reflecting on the work of geographers and also on the work of phenomenologists who in turn reflect on place and trying to approach this through a metaphysical angle. And, you know, it's, it's very much a work in progress. And right now what I'm presenting covers a lot of ground. So you, you'll probably see that at times it feels a bit of stretch. Um, but, you know, one of the reasons is hopefully to, to be able to get some of the insight from geographers onto, onto this. And if you have any questions, you can maybe raise a hand. I'm only seeing Rory on the screen, so maybe if you raise a hand, Rory can make me assign this. Uh, I'm I'm not seeing everybody. Uh, and otherwise, I, I we'll just have Q and A at the at the very end. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So, you know, you see, the, this is a power station, um, and then which eventually became the Tate Modern which most of you will probably recognize if, if you've ever been in London or, um, or, or even just through photos. And something that's very interesting is that both of them were, are very distinct places. You walk into the Tate Modern and you have a strong sense of place, uh, of what this place is. And especially when buildings get abandoned, when buildings get repurposed, it raises a lot of questions that are classic metaphysical questions of um, when did the power station cease to exist? Was it when it was abandoned? Did it never cease to exist because the location is the same and some of the structure is the same? And when did the Tate Modern start to exist? This is out of uh, decisions that people make or common perception of a building. Is it yes about the material engagement of people with um, with what eventually will become the Tate Modern? Is it about how people use the place? There are all of these questions that um, really have um, some metaphysical background to the, to the very questions about what the boundaries of places are, both spatially and temporally, what the nature of place is. And these are metaphysical puzzles that takes you on to, to look at the metaphysics of place. And a very good place to start is historically, because while right now there is not much work within analytic philosophy, um, which could be called metaphysics of place, uh, not to say known, uh, there is there is historically work on the metaphysics of place. Um, most famously, Aristotle probably, but um, the best treatise here is uh, by Edward Casey called The Fate of Place, uh, Philosophical History. And the central idea uh, the, that he is advancing with the book is that uh, beginning in the 6th century AD and reaching an apogee in 14th century theology and above all in 17th century physics, place has been assimilated to a space. So here in, in Aristotle, place was central. It was like one of the categories and a very key element in all of his philosophy. And 
he has this um, quote that kind of sums it up in a way in the physics. The physicist must have a knowledge of place, namely whether there is such a thing or not, and the manner of its existence and what it is. And here is some Blucus saying that place has an active power as well as an incorporeal and definitive reality. So here are two key elements, reality and power, that I think are very important throughout any discussions of um, place. And then I'm skipping a lot of the uh, argument from Casey, obviously, but um, here you get uh, Descartes, for whom place is reduced to location. So he only starts thinking of a set of locations in a space. And you get Locke, for whom place is a modification of a space. So a space is fundamental and place is somehow um, almost epiphenomenal in this, in this sense. And here there's this quote um, by William Gilbert around the same time that really sums up what the uh, movement was uh, with regards to place, especially in comparison to space. And when he says that place is nothing, does not exist, has no strength. And here again, this is this question of nothing. Uh, is this question of uh, whether it exists or not, whether it is a real thing uh, or a projection or an illusion, related again with whether it has a strength. Before we saw that um, ancient philosophers were defending that it is real and has an active power. And here, you know, a thousand and something uh, years later, place is nothing and has no strength. And obviously, uh, 17th century physics were mostly concerned with space, no longer with place. And what about now? So here, uh, Tim Creswell in his uh, place and introduction, which is uh, one of the uh, best overviews of uh, current, if uh, maybe like uh, 10 or 20, 10 years ago, um, it was one of the best overviews of current uh, views on place. Uh, there have probably been new developments since then. Um, but he outlines two major contemporary currents when it comes to theorizing about place social constructionism and phenomenology. And social constructionism is the idea that place is a social construct. And Harvey here in relation to this makes it clear there's not only an ontological uh, claim, it's also a methodological claim that goes, the two go hand in hand. The only interesting question that can be asked is by what social processes is place constructed? Here during Macy says, well, this is not a quote anymore. If you can see where it's a quote or not by the by the quotations, but in in Macy's work, there's the idea of uh, place as the product of interrelation and place as always under construction. As these are probably like two classical examples of the social construction is views on place. And in phenomenology, you get geographers who turn their focus to the experience of place, and on the other hand, philosophers who do phenomenology and turn their focus to place. And here, uh, from the side of geographers, you get one who says place is a space imbued with meaning and a slightly different flavor to things coming from the phenomenologies. And here, Heidegger, who especially in his later work is uh, dealing with place uh, quite centrally. Uh, he says, what is place? Place opens a region by every time gathering things into their belonging together. And this idea of a region in which things gather together uh, is very much in contemporary uh, accounts of place in phenomenology. So this is by Jeff Malpass, who is one of the leading figures, saying something that's very much resonant with Heidegger. The concept of place is essentially the concept of a bounded but open region within which a set of interconnected elements can be located. And importantly, the interest is not so much in place as experience, which might be the focus of geographers interested in the experience of place, uh, people like Ed Edward Ralph or people like Tuan. But instead, for phenomenologists, it's a focus on the way in which place can be viewed as a structure within which experience is possible. So the idea that places a structure, our conscious experience, our sense of self, um, all of these kind of things. And obviously, since uh, Tim Creswell's distinction between these two major um, camps, there's been 
uh, more developments, uh, things like new materialism or uh, non-representational theory. And here is uh, Willis, for example, from one of the more recent developments on non-human, uh, more than human uh, agents and plays. Uh, here Willis says, the construction of plays by humans is never finalizable because we live in a world that stubbornly remains more than what we make of it. Even on a highway or train tag, non-human animals pursuing their own ends can break through human representations and change the meanings of those places. So here again, starting from the social constructionist idea, but then putting an emphasis on the actions of the more than human. And then you get the idea that places coalesce out of the enactment of more than human practices, so not only human practices, ideas again of uh, power. So from a recent paper from Adams and Cotus that places have agent agentive power, that they compel people to act in certain ways, and that they might be considered to be a type of actant. So they're no longer just the product of social action, but also they are modifying themselves social action, they become um, actants or agents um, um, for a simpler theoretical construct. And here I will put the more recent developments kind of in parentheses for now. And I will look at uh, just the contrast between phenomenology and social constructionism. And, you know, th there's actually historically much more, uh, they're much more intertwined, especially in the development of social constructionism. Uh, a lot of the people came from phenomenology towards social constructionism, but especially in the turn of the century, um, approaches to place, they, they tend to be seen as somehow antithetical views or, or at least, you know, not, con not something that's been reconciled. And I think what's interesting is that focusing on this uh, tension between the two approaches can tell us a lot about what they are the conceptual distinctions. Uh, that matter for place. And also I think solving those issues, um, those conceptual issues can provide the conceptual foundations for interdisciplinary work. So if we can make some kind of uh, theory of place that seems to accommodate both the commitments of phenomenologies and uh, social constructionists, it seems like it will be a broad enough boat for also psychologies, anthropologies uh, coming to work on place, or at the very least that the ontological commitments will be made much more explicit. And my, the hope with this project is that uh, this opposition can be resolved through metaphysical analysis of the ontological status and the causal power of place. Now, the ontological status of place is something that um, is actively debated uh, between phenomenology and social constructionists. So here again, Malpass is saying, there is no doubt that the ordering of a particular place is not independent of social ordering. However, this does not legitimate the claim that places are merely social constructions. And in another paper, he says, being caused by something is not identical with being constructed by that thing. So this is clearly a critique of social constructionism from the uh, phenomenological standpoint. And what's interesting is this idea that they are not merely social constructions, right? As if social construction were somehow lesser, so place couldn't be uh, a social construction. And here's a general um, question about really what does it mean for something to be socially constructed? And sometimes this is understood in different ways by different social constructionist thinkers. So here Sayer says that the use of the hopelessly misleading metaphor of, of construction invites idealist slippage, for it evades the question of the relationship of our social constructions to the nature of the reference. And obviously social constructionism and phenomenology are incompatible views. If one takes the former to say that place is not real and the latter to say that place is essential to existence. What I want to advance though is a realist position uh, compatible with phenomenological approaches through which to defend that place is a social construction. And this position will also be amenable, I think, to recent work coming from non-representational theory and new materialism. Although that's more of a bonus point. It's not the central focus of the, of the paper. And 
again, central here is what's the question of what is a social construction and then what does it mean to say that place is socially constructed? Here's what uh, Alcon and Trogot have to say about place and social construction. They say place narratives are important, however, because of what they inspire actors to do. Dominant ideas about the place, history can direct its future actions. Place meaning can influence policy and therefore the landscape itself. So here you get a view that's like quite a weak claim. It's just simply that people's ideas about a place modify a place, right? Um, and this is a distinction that Sopper makes and that also uh, Tim Croswell makes, that landscape may be said to be culturally formed in the double sense that they are materially molded and transformed by specific cultural practices. And in the sense that they are experienced through the mediation of cultural discourse and representation. And this is similar to the distinction that Creswell makes between uh, two ways of interpreting the social constructionist claims about place. One in terms of materiality and one in terms of meaning. So materiality is simply the idea that places are socially caused, basically like our cultural practices are transforming places all the time, which is oh, fair enough. What about meaning? Well, how could we understand a place that the meaning of place is socially constructed. Here's an idea, again, a bit old by Greider and uh, Garkovich. Landscapes are the symbolic environments created by human acts of conferring meaning to nature and the environment, of giving from the environment, of, give, of giving the environment definition and form from a particular angle of vision and through a special filter of values and beliefs. So, this is actually something that most phenomenologists will be happy with. Uh, here's uh, Ralph, who is a famous uh, geographer using phenomenological methods, uh, saying something very similar. The relationship between community and place is indeed a very powerful one in which each reinforces the identity of the other and in which landscape is very much an expression of communally held beliefs and values and of interpersonal involvements. So I think that the claim that the meaning of place is socially constructed is so congruous with phenomenology, precisely because it does not tell us much about the ontological status of place itself. You can still say that place is a fundamental structure the way the phenomenologists claim, while saying that our experience of place and the, our ideas of place and the meaning that we give place is socially constructed. Um, but it doesn't tell you much about place itself? What type of entity is it? Is it fundamental? Uh, how does it relate to a space? Um, is it dependent on us? Could it exist if there were no humans? These kind of questions. Because, for example, our ideas about gravity are socially constructed, but most people will think that gravity itself is not. And its ontological standing is certainly not diminished just because our ideas of it are social constructs. And there might be more to social constructionism about place than the rather uncontentious view that place is socially caused and its meaning socially constructed. There might be a stronger claim that um, it's in the background here. And here are three quotes that I think point in that stronger direction. One is that places do not exist apart from larger cultural notions. Places do not exist until they are verbalized, first in thought and memory, and then through the spoken or written word. And the last one, the reality of place emerges and is confirmed in the common symbolic languages and discourses of people. So here is like a very clear dependence of place on cultural notions, on verbalization, on representations, on discourses, right? It's a much stronger claim. It's the idea that place depends on these things. Place couldn't exist without these things. And you know, it's the idea that there is something necessarily social about the being of place, is essentially social somehow. Harvey defends that places are defined by social processes, right? And this view shifts the emphasis away from discourse. Um, this is Harvey's view from the views of discourse that we saw in the previous slide to um, into practices of meaning making in line with more recent non-representational work in geography. So here I will be following more Harvey's uh, take, which is that places are defined by social processes, which is a bit broader than just the notion that they are defined by discourse. Um, so it has more to do with uh, not only discourse, which is a social process, but also practices. Now, I want to advance a 
an idea from uh, Sven Stotir. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that name correctly. Uh, Scandinavian name, I think. Um, which is um, that an entity is socially constituted, right? So this is a view of uh, social construction, saying that social construction it really comes down to social constitution, right? And an entity is socially constituted if we must refer to social factors in order to define it. So there is no way of thinking or of defining this entity without making reference to social factors. And that this is um, a line of argument that has been used to defend that things like money, marriage, race, gender are social, uh, socially constituted, that they're social constructs. And this is somewhat different from gravity, right, that we could define and we could explain without referring to social factors. And also from some elements that might be socially caused, but they might not be socially constituted, like graphene. Graphene is an element, it's a material that was um, created in the University of Manchester artificially and that, you know, in a way, wouldn't exist without our social practices. But there is nothing about graphene that's essentially social in the way that is true of money, marriage, race, and gender, uh, purportedly, right? So there seems to be two different kinds of socially constructed entities. One are things that we cause or things that, you know, the idea of which are socially caused or socially constructed, and the other one are more entities of the social world uh, more properly. And then the question becomes, is place socially constituted? And what does that mean for the ontological status of, of place? Because actually, once you look at this, social entities might be both real and mind dependent. Saying that something is socially constituted doesn't mean that something is imaginary or a projection or an idea. And here Mason says that demonstrating that social kinds are mind dependent is not sufficient to demonstrate that they are not real. Social kind anti-realism must also show that being mind dependent in the relevant sense makes social kinds unreal. And again, it all depends on what we mean by real. And you know, we have to again go back to this question, right? Um, from William Gilbert that place is nothing, does not exist, has no strength. And think about that if we understand place as social construction, is that the case? And here, as I mentioned earlier, is this idea that it has no strength. I want to link this to causal power, right? The link between causal power and the reality of place. And when, when people tend to, you know, lesser uh, the, the ontological status of place, it tends to go hand, hand in hand with uh, a demoting also the causal power of place or the agentive power of place sometimes. Here, Harvey actually says to, to write of the power of place as if places possess causal powers is to engage in the greatest of fetishisms, right? This obviously comes from Marxist theory, but um, I found it very interesting because as I was reading this, it's quite similar to a quote uh, from one of the ancient philosophers, right? Who was, when, when, there was a debate about the ontological status of place in ancient times. Uh, Philoponus said, to say place has power is ridiculous. So here, Maki and Oinas in a review of questions of causal power and realism in geography, uh, say that what geographical realism offers us is not the realist ontology, but rather one possible realist ontology, realism about powers, right? This is quite similar to something that in philosophy is called the causal criterion of reality. It's the idea that something is real if and only if it possesses causal power. So if we can say that place possesses causal power, um, then we can say that place is real, even if place is socially constituted. And there's been a recent application of this idea to other social kinds by Khalid in 2016. Now, let me see. Um, here, here again is uh, this brought to geography, right? Uh, by Whiteside. It's the causal claims are fundamentally irreconcilable with anti realist ontologies, uh, some of which are postmodern or contrast constructivist ontologies. What human geographers do with this conundrum remains to be seen. So it seems that really here it is the tension whether place has causal power or not, and what that tells us about. Uh, what place is. 
So turning to the last part on place and power, I want to use um, a recent development, relatively recent development in metaphysics, in analytic metaphysics, and try to apply it to this discussion of place. And it's the uh, discussions of grounding, right? Grounding is a metaphysical directional dependence relations in which some features of reality give rise to other features of reality. And importantly, this is a constitutive, not causal, causal relation that does not reduce to necessity or supervenience. And it connects to uh, explanatory power in the sense that derivative entities can be explained in terms of the entities that ground them. So for example, if you think that facts in chemistry ground facts in biology, then you can explain some facts in biology by um, discuss by just in terms of the facts in, um, in chemistry. And here's an idea that to be socially constructed is to be grounded in distinctive social patterns. So I want to, I want to give a particular rhythm. It's a very broad literature of social grounding and it's social grounding as social realization. Right, the idea is that social kinds are functionally defined multiply realizable kinds. So the grounds that realize the social construct are systematic, relatively stable, and structured as a network. So we have something like a network of social practices, and out of that network of social practices emerges uh, an entity, which is the social construct. Um, this is actually not very different than what social constructionists wanted to do. So in a way, while it is different, it's ontological commitments, uh, especially the idealist ontological commitments of some of the social constructionists, it still serves for the methodological purposes of a lot of social constructionism. Here's Harvey saying that places are constructed and experienced as material ecological artifacts and intricate networks of social relations. So you get this idea of an intricate network out of which emerges a place. The difference, though, is that the emergent place has its own causal power in turn, and we can consider it real for that reason. And again, partly is because there's just more metaphysical discussion here. And I think in virtue of those metaphysical underpinnings, it can bridge key elements from the two main camps in the theorizing of place and can serve as a basis for interdisciplinary work. So, now that we have this idea that place somehow emerges out of the social network and that we can understand this in terms of grounding and that we can explain the causal power of place because it is an emergent entity, uh, we can go back to some of the discussion between phenomenology and social constructionism. Here Malpass says that the social does not exist prior to place nor is it given expression except in and through place. So it is that the dependency is not from um, social to place, the way that a social constructionist could have it is actually the other way around. The social only happens in place. That's what the phenomenologists could say. But, you know, and, and if Malpass is right, then on the social constructionist position, there'll be an untenable feedback loop between place and the social. However, the social happens in place is not the same as the social is grounded in place, right? So we can define social processes without reference to place, even if said social processes cannot be placeless. The idea is that even if we say that place is essentially social because we need to refer to social processes or social factors to define place and to define places, um, it doesn't work the other way around because when we go from the social factors to the place direction, we get a constitutive dependence, a grounding um, relation. Um, the idea that social factors, social processes ground the being of place. Place is constituted by a network of social processes. However, when we go from the place to the social factors direction, the social processes are not grounded in place. They're not constituted by place. They're influenced by place. They happen in place. The dependence is of a different nature. And here the idea is that places are 
um, a type of emergent social entity. Um, so this is based on an idea by Griffith on emergent social entities. So what I will uh, what I will defend is that emergent social entities such as plays do not ontologically reduce to the realizers because their causal powers are not identical to the causal powers of the realizers. Even if you have a network of social processes and out of that network of social processes, places emerge, the power of place is not the same as the power of place of the network. That's what makes place a real entity. And this is the idea in a lot of discussions of emergence that realized kinds have their own distinctive power profile. The power of place is a social power, a capacity that depends upon social factors to produce a given outcome. And this is because place is socially constituted. And of course, the causal power of place will be nonlinear, um, which is in line with recent conceptions of causation in human geography and with uh, dynamic system theory. So the idea is that places emerge out of dynamic processes and a regularity notion of causation, something like if A causes B, the name must always be followed by B, which is the classical notion of causation. Um, it cannot, it can simply not be meaningfully um, uh, de defined for systems without linear interactions among their variables. For a mathematical discussion, you can see Wagner for a, for a more detailed thing. And one second. The, um, the idea then is that the power of place comes down to the way in which it structures action, social relations, and experience, often through the materiality of place itself. Place is structure and normative landscape, the way in which ideas about what is right, just, and appropriate are transmitted across people. This normative landscape, however, has a tangible materiality in the way one ought to sit at a theater is mandated both by etiquette and by the arrangement of seats facing the stage. Places create constraints, both social and physical, or rather the physical and the social powers of place can hardly be untangled in this case. And this physicality connects to the spatiality of place. When places emerge out of social processes, they demarcate a region. Here is the region uh, that the phenomenologists will be talking about, the region of interconnected elements. This notion resonates with the phenomenological conception of place open in a region that gathers things in their belonging together. In more recent phenomenological accounts, the boundaries of said regions are open, porous, and malleable, which is what we will expect given that places emerge out of social processes. Here's you know, more recent, a more recent account from Casey on boundaries. A highly permeable edge that offers little resistance to its being crossed in one direction or the other. So in a nutshell, the relationship between grounding, emergence, and powers when it comes to place. If you look at the Tate Modern, uh, and we ask when did the Tate Modern arise? How did it arise? It was not out of plans and decisions alone, so not out of discourse alone, that the place in question emerged, but out of the physicality of those plans put into practice through building, out of those social processes. The farther the social interactions with the emergence place went, the farther the turbine hall was molded into existence. And this was precisely because the turbine hall came to mold those interactions in return. It became a place through its emergent causal power. The turbine hall, the Tate Modern, um, became real by, in return, um, interacting with the people who were, who were constructing it, with the people who were visiting it, with the artists, uh, with the staff. It is because of the causal power, because of the way it structures a normative landscape that places come to exist. So this idea of places an emergent network of social processes. This conception lays the ground for a common theorizing about place and for future interdisciplinary work can be embraced within non-representational theory in virtue of the processual and dynamic character of the proposed view. And it's also highly amenable to new materialist approaches if one is open to a more than human understanding of what social processes are. And I think once we focus on materiality and on practices rather than on discourse, that becomes much easier. And thanks to the analysis of grounding offered here, uh, the proposed view has solid metaphysical foundations, but it is supple enough to accommodate the various theoretical commitments that researchers from different disciplines might ascribe to. Once we understand places grounded on social factors 
and yet with a distinctive emergent power, the tension between antithetical conception of place withers away. Place is an emergent network of social processes and place has power. Oh, thanks so much. Well, I think I managed to make that in the 40 minutes, right? <laughs> I had to rush it a bit, sorry about that. You did. Good, Th thank you so much, Pablo. It's a lot to, to, to take in as well. Um, that was kind of a, 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 they covered a lot of ground, a lot of philosoph philosophical ground. Um, uh, yeah, one, I mean, one of the things that I've worked on, it's almost like a, it's one of these entities, um, which is not necessarily talked of very often as a, a place, but it's almost like the meta um, entity, a meta object, as a Tim Timothy Morton would call it, of, um, a, a philosopher who I, I do not rate, by the way, but I uh, um, could qualify, is the, the idea of the Anthropocene, you know, this idea that the, the planet itself is, a, is a, um, now become a, a, a new period of, in the Earth's history, which is shaped by social processes. So we have the, you know, the discussion of like the so-called age of man and so on, that the Earth system itself and its very processes has shifted into this new age where it's somehow a socially constructed um, earth but yet that social construction doesn't kind of uh the, the the earth and its systems made up of dynamic and procedural processual um uh, patterns of of interrelations are not solely shaped by the earth we have shifted it into a, a new phase but the earth has its own powers and, and we, are, we are acting as one force amongst others in, in the production of this and it seemed to me that this is something quite close to to what you're um, I'm talking about and, and in many ways the, the discussions around the Anthropocene in geography but in other related disciplines has kind of you know has crystallized a lot of discussions that have been going on for quite a number of decades about the relationship between nature and society and how, and how we understand that relationship um, philosophically and I, I think that's kind of you know at one point in your discussion there you were talking about the relationship between landscape and, and place a lot of the malpass kind of stuff and actually it, it seems to me that in some sense there's a it's not so much i mean landscape and place being synonymous is, is is problematic i think probably for geographers but it's this relationship between social processes um and the agency of um of social processes and human actors which are not of course limited to the intention of the actors not necessarily plans and decisions as you say but the the effects that are had in the world um, and then the, the other effects of, of mere stuff, you know, um, the kind of materiality, whether it's the concrete of the tit modern or, you know, the, the weather system and so on. But actually, it, there's quite a lot of, of, I don't know if you look at that literature, but the kind of socio-ecological or human nature relations that uh, okay, it's trying to do a slightly different philosophical thing. And it, it does engage at times with place, but there's actually kind of philosophical um, resources there to, that are kind of working in quite a similar place where you 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 end up here where um you know as you said kind of leaving you in a place similar to or you know not similar to but um relatable to non-representational theory and new materialist kind of thought about the kind of procedural dynamic processes where there's a social construction um in relation to a broader set of agents beyond the, the mere the social acting um, but there's kind of some kind of ontological reality and not just an ontological reality beyond, but a kind of a set of powers, of forces that exist beyond the human the human causation. I realize that's not a question, sorry, it's just a, a long ramble. But uh, I think there, there are uh, questions coming in. Um, if you want, I mean, I can also I reflect back on, on what sure, you Sure, sure, um, sure. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, here, when I say new materialism, that's like super broad, right? And, and even within the literature, what it means is not very unified because you get uh, things like um, Karen Barat, and then you get things like the more vibrant materialism. Uh, so it is, it is quite, um, yeah, it, it is quite unclear. Some people think like new materialism somehow encompasses also the object-oriented ontology. Uh, so it's, it, it again depends. It certainly. Something that is common, I think, in geography and also in other in other uh, humanities, uh, the humanities disciplines, uh, is really more attention to uh, non-human agents, more attention to, you know, maybe what uh, what Latour might call actants, mm -hmm. and 
you know, the power of materiality, uh, these kind of things, which I think um, it's, it comes from a very different place, obviously, than analytic metaphysics. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it, it is it is quite, um, yeah, there is a lot of, it seems to be going in the same direction. Mm. Uh, something that I wanted to avoid um, is a lot of the theoretical baggage that each of the new waves brings with it. Uh, because I think in a way that really hampers uh, interdisciplinary discussions. So what I wanted to do was bring some tools from analytic metaphysics but really think about it. Of course, any tool will have some ontological baggage, but it, like try to keep it to a minimum in a way and just try to use the tools for analysis of existing theories of place and try to find some common ground. And from that, try to have, you know, like a notion that's in a way a minimal notion that then everybody can interpret uh, in a slightly different ways, but can use actively for, you know, if. If like a psychologist wants to con collaborate with an anthropologist and they need like a notion of place, uh, it becomes very difficult if they also need to buy the whole object-oriented ontology because they, they need to like read up a lot of books and like really try to imagine, completely reimagine their discipline. And, and it's uh, it's a bit difficult in that sense. Well, I think if you, if you really try to keep the theoretical commitments to a minimum, uh, it's, it's always good for... I think it's a good, I think, in general, epistemological exercise. Um, but yeah, in a way, what, what a lot of the Timothy Morton uh, work, for example, the, the work on hyperobjects, right? I imagine for him, the Anthropocene will be one of these hyperobjects, is that they are its own object that has like causal powers that he actually thinks about in terms of powers. I think a lot of them kind of like shy away from calling it causal powers, partly because they have like a notion of causality that's too close to a regular notion of causality. But even if you work within dynamic systems theory that they're referencing all the time, there is causation there. It's just different. Uh, it's nonlinear causation. Oh. But yeah, in, in that sense, I think it is a bit similar. Um, I am hoping in a way to pare it down uh, much more and also connected to uh, previous work rather than saying it's like some radical departure from phenomenology or radical oh. departure from social constructionism. Uh, but just really looking at like what's the common ground and what does it mean in terms of ontology and what that will mean in terms of methodology. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's probably a broader, like a, a question, set of questions and a, and a history to think about the, the relationship between thinking in the natural sciences, often which, do, which doesn't figure itself or, or present itself as philosophical and doesn't work in that register, but feeds then into the work of, you know, social theorization and the humanities, but then into the work of philosophy proper, let's say big, big P philosophy, um, mm -hmm. in terms of thinking about the, like the ideas of non-linear systems and dynamic uh, interrelated systems that we kind of see developing in earth system science and areas of ecology and that kind of coming in, in a, as a set of kind of tools or a mode of thinking, a modality or a, a, a methodology of thinking about the relationship between things, which is not tied necessarily to earth systems or you know coastal dynamics or or whatever. And mm -hmm. um, Mark uh, had uh, had written here; uh, he had to run to teach class. Uh, um, he said, "Excellent, Pablo. Uh, thanks." Um, some pred, oh, it's an author. He cites tries to interweave the historical contingent transformation of nature into his conceptual model. Yeah, he sa says he has to to go, but he, he gives this literature prompt. I'm not sure if you were aware of this work, Alan Pred. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this one I, I have read recently. I haven't um, immersed into the paper yet because I wrote the paper. I got feedback. I'm waiting for, you know, enough feedback to rewrite the, the paper and redo the work uh, all at once rather than like keep on stitching it. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I do. I do have it and it is quite relevant. It's, I mean, one of the difficulties obviously is that this is very, very broad. It may be better as a book than as a paper. And there is also work coming from a lot of disciplines and even within a discipline from a lot of different currents. So how they all connect is not is very often not straightforward. And I think in a way, something that's a weakness in, in what I just presented is that it's a bit flattening some of the distinctions within the fields, uh, within the social constructionism or within phenomenology. Um, so it's, yeah, uh, th that's something that I think requires further analysis also. I, th I think there'd be a lot of upset um, <laughs> when you were uh, at one point talking about social constructivism. I think when it's framed as social constructivism versus phenomenology, it makes sense. But you were kind of 
looking at, at uh, David Harvey's work, for example, at the same time as non-representational theory, there'd be, there would be absolute rage <laughs> from, you know, uh, Harvey's, I mean, I think in, in the sense you were saying that they're, they both want to look at practices and material relations beyond purely discursive understanding. I mean, of, even, of, even Harvey's work is not exactly, like he doesn't see, when, when, when like in his book, he doesn't see himself as part of the social constructionist uh, yeah. movement, I think he's in, like he sees it more as like some kind of uh, Marxism uh, approach, you know. It's just that these ideas were very popular at the time, so a lot of it, yes. you know, the other places socially constructed is is also very present there. And I think partly the reason that I find his emphasis on social processes, on you know, this idea that they're like uh, places are ecological artifacts, a bit more in tune with uh, newer um, ideas about place. Um, or new ideas in, ge in geography in general, is that he wasn't really fully within the, you know, the trend that was like very much uh, emphasis on discourse and things like that. Mm. It's, it's, uh, it's always important to remember that Harvey, before he was a Marxist geographer, was a historical geographer, you know, and he was interested in in, in beer making in, in it was Lancashire or somewhere. Um, and he went to America and was kind of politicized through the, the civil rights movement um, and housing crisis in, in Baltimore. But he, he still, I think you can still see both his work as a physical geographer and this other type of non-Marxist historical geographer um, um, that kind of feeds through in a kind of philosophical sense, even though it's not necessarily schematized and, and presented as, I mean, he does have some work where he, it's not, it would be his lesser cited works where he tries to engage with the the, the philosophy that underpins his thought other than, other than Marxism. And mm -hmm. uh, are, there, are there other questions? No, thank you. I just want to thank you very much. Uh, it was very interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Carlotta. Hi, uh, Phil here. Thanks, Pablo. Really interesting. Sorry, I, I arrived a little bit late, so I'm just wondering about the the, the example of Tate Modern, um, and I'm intrigued a little bit about how you might relate it to the wider transformation taking place at that time and then also how Tate Modern Mark II, the second addition to it, kind of might might link in with some of those debates. So the kind of the notion of place and power is really intertwined, you know, in London in terms of if you go back to 2000 when Tate Modern was developed, you know, it's I suppose to draw on Harvey, it's it's very much part of that kind of entrepreneurial kind of culturally driven transformation taking place at that time, of which Bankside was part and parcel. And it's interesting now, just by coincidence, I was in London last weekend, and it's now dwarfed essentially by kind of its surroundings, where we see kind of things are going up another level, essentially, you know, with the shard and the other kind of buildings around Bankside. So I suppose I'm kind of interested in, in it relationally, you know, in terms of how, you know, you, you talk about the turbine hall um, and how it's produced and how we might think about that in terms of the wider transformation of Bankside at that time and how that linked into kind of global London you know, in that image of that time as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's a very interesting question. Well, something that I'm not dealing with in, in this presentation, but I was starting to look at now, is how places are always in relation, but also in relation to other places. So how places make each other in a way. Uh, so as you say, like the Tate Modern is not only this particular place, but also it is within a place and next to a place. And that in itself changes the identity. Um, so I think you can really see it probably in things like, um, you know, the different urban policies, uh, which have in turn an ideology behind. They seem to move like waves through the landscape, kind of reshaping places, destroying some places pra practically, and making other places new places. Um, I saw it, well, I, I didn't see it. Uh, because I was uh, too young, I think, uh, in the early 2000s, but I saw it with the Olympics, uh, because in UCL, I, I, I do give some talks sometimes in the Bartlett School of Architecture, and they have a kind of outpost in what's called UCL here East, and that's an area, this, the Olympic Park, uh, where, and, and Hackney in general, where a lot of change has happened, and Again, it's this uh, kind of entrepreneurial vision, especially if you go to the to the business park, basically, uh, and how that actually. What what I think happens is very interesting in those cases because you can see like a very high level discourse that tries to go down um, into 
the remaking of places. And very often you see a resistance, not always an active resistance, but just by the very fact of being there, of something else being there before. You see the previous social practices and practice of resistance as actually molding the place, not solely in the direction of the intended policy, but a constant kind of fight over what places are. And, and what's interesting is that out of this, it is out of this that places emerge. It's not out of like the discourse itself or even the fight between the discourse. It's about like what people very often do with their bodies in place. I really like in, in Oxford, uh, you see the, the side business school that's like on your way to the train station, you pass the side business school that's like super clean um, building. And it always has like teenagers doing skateboarding. And I absolutely love that. That like yeah. they really change what this, for me, that's the place where the teenagers do a skateboarding. And they had made this huge empty space, you know, that seemed to like, uh, you know, a very, very light stone and, and it seems to be very businessy. But then obviously, because you make all that space, that's where teenagers go to the skateboarding. Yeah. And that kind of thing where it's not just about discourse, it's very much the place becomes what people make of it. Yeah. No, that, that's really interesting. And that ties in, uh, I would have used Ed Ralph's work on place and placelessness years ago. And then in a way I critiqued that through the example of skateboarding because he was kind of, you know, I suppose critiquing modernist spaces at that time, you know, around sort of 2003, 2004, I, I, I wrote about this in terms of skateboarding. And it's just so fascinating to see. It, it's, it's a really good example of how people make places. Um, but in terms of Bankside, uh, they used to, you know, the kind of when Bankside was first being developed, was these large things saying Bankside, there's about three or four of them kind of dotted around the area near Tate Modern. Um, but there was a great piece where somebody had just come along and put, we are in front of the, the official Bankside. And I thought it was a great kind of reclaiming of place, essentially, and place making from the bottom up, which you alluded to there as well. Yeah, I remember in, in Athens, uh, in the one of the neighborhoods of Athens where they made all of the remodelation for the Olympics, and then it got completely, so they pushed everybody out, and then it got completely abandoned. Uh, there was this very big graffiti that said, we are still here. Yeah. You know, it's, it's great. Great. I, don't, I don't remember what it said originally. Sure. I remember what it like in that. Yeah. But thanks for, thanks for the talk and apologies I was late. No, no worries. I think it's recorded and it'll be on YouTube if you great. want. Great. That's the, the, first, uh, the first bit. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much. I don't know if anybody has any other questions kind of on the dot now. I do have one more. Mm -hmm. But uh, Iris, were you going to? to you're, you're muted. No, I'm, I'm. I'm sitting here deep in thought because this is all really, really interesting to me. I can't, you know, I, I mean, I can't sort of. I'll, I'll have to mull it over a little bit more, and and in, in order to formulate a, um, a question. I'm a physical geographer here, Pablo, and I, I, I just thank you first of all for coming to to speak to us. I'm also head of department um, here, and uh, really enjoy these kinds of seminars. And I, I work on. Um, physical geography at the, in terms of coastal uh, climate adaptation and, and mitigation and so on. And of course, I think about place and the meaning of place and the interaction between social uh, processes and places very much the more I do this because of the, the threat to place that in a way that people perceive on account of coastal erosion and flooding and, you know, their displacement as a result of that. So I'm currently sitting here mulling over it to, to think about what all this means and, and who I'm sure people have worked on this, but I haven't, I'm just not familiar enough with the literature. Mm. Um, but it would be really, really interesting. And it's something that we need to think about a lot more as we go forward as to how we negotiate that sort of tension between it comes back to some of the points I think that Rory was making earlier um, about the the nature um, and and societal relationship and the power of nature and the you know the perception of defense against nature encroaching on our places or taking away our places and so there's there's a lot going on in my, in my head but I can't quite put it into a question. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much for coming along today. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much. I mean, I, I, I kind of did want to just come back to that. And I, I think it's, I, th I thought the, I mean, the, the, your meditation and kind of bringing us through this kind of parsing of, of the different approaches philosophically and, and kind of maybe extra philosophically as a discipline, um, or ex extra to philosophy as a discipline, but philosophical nonetheless. Um, I kind of set out a kind of philosophical like, topology of, of place. And the, the kind of question for, or the term that's more questionable to me or, or a question arises around is power. 
and and that seemed a somewhat more under theorized or something and i kind of think i'm, I'm just like noted here like a kind of topology of places and some of the places that we've been talking about different types of places so you know the tape modern or I don't know, a skate park playground, uh, an urban plaza that's, you know, contested in some ways, or even the Zoom gathering or, you know, a waste dump that no one goes to see. But these are places that are that are very clearly, strongly shaped by social practices. And, and uh, if, if not, they're not saturated in their construction by social practices, but they're shaped predominantly. And then you have other places such as, you know, a top of a mountain or a peat bog or the bottom of the ocean. And it's not that they are. There's nowhere in in, in anywhere in, in on Earth now that is um, um, unshaped, at least in the surface of the Earth, that is unshaped by human social practices. But nonetheless, there that there we see natural forces more to the fore. And I wonder is there kind of something about like trying to dig into the kind of like a, if there's a, you've given us a topology of place philosophically. I wonder is there kind of a a topology of of power or powers in the plural. I'm trying to think of a, of a different way we talk about different modes of power. There was various types. I didn't actually write them down, sadly. When you were talking, there was power appeared as different modes. Mm. Um, you know, mm. causal power. Uh, there was kind of natural actors, different types of actants, whatever. And then we had, of course, social power uh, as understood as economic processes, processes of capital, you know, look, community resistance. Um, but there's all sorts of, of different uh, not just different actors, but different modes of understanding what power is or what force might be, or you know. So um, um, I don't know if you have something to. Yeah, I mean, here I've been focusing mostly, I think, on causal power, and causal power is very broad because uh, if you are a sociologist, you could also look at the causal power of different social processes, right? It's mm. not a causal power in the sense of um, you know, one um, billiard ball hitting another, but it's really whether there are effects that you know are like an event a causes like another series mm -hmm. of events uh so that you know to explain say the trajectory of the latter series of events you go back and make reference to the previous events that that kind of uh causal power so it's broad enough that you could you could really think about it also in economics in psychology in uh, sociology um it is interesting how it connects with uh, all their notions of power. That's not something that I have uh, explored yet, but I mean, that's something that, however, a lot of the social constructionists have studied much more in depth. Like, and what they study mostly is how uh, power relations are manifested in place and kind of enacted and maintained mm -hmm. through place. Um, here, I'm much more interested on place as a, an entity that has the causal power. Mm -hmm. so, so much as a kind of like mirror of the power or maintainer of the power, but really almost as its own thing that does its, you know, it, it does its own thing mm. in a way. Um, obviously influence, and there's like a lot of uh, feedback loops. Um, but that's uh, that's what I've been looking at. And the, the separate question of uh, what happens like on the top of a mountain is really, I think, the harder question. Because when you think of something like social processes, um, you start to want to be broader by what that means, by what social processes mean. You want to, for example, um, allow for non-human animals to have also social processes. Mm -hmm. Like, For example, if wolves have a territory and they mark that yeah. territory, in, in a separate paper, I, I look at how wolves mark territories through both, mm -hmm. uh, you know, living marks and also howling, and how they really, you can observe like the different places of wolves. Right. Um, so, and then it, you know, the farther, the problem is because a lot of the examples have been centered on humans, the farther you go from humans, the, the harder it gets to, to really bring this kind of analysis that was really developed for social entities like, you know, money or marriage, oh. or, mm -hmm. it does get trickier and trickier, but it seems that especially if you want to, you know, like in a lot of, uh, contemporary theorizing really kind of criticize this nature culture divide then it might be that at the end what the social process is becomes very different than what we thought was a process a social process when we started the theorizing and that's uh -huh. something that i just need to kind of like keep on scratching about to figure out yeah we're we're at uh, we're past two o'clock so i was five past two so i, I will i will wind up the the recording but thank you so much pablo that was uh, really really uh, uh fascinating and uh yeah very very thought-provoking for for a lunchtime <laughs> thank yeah. you so much for that 
Um, brilliant. Uh, so I'll pause the or stop the recording.